If you have your Bibles today, would you turn with me, please? Thank you, musicians and singers. Turn with me to the book of Genesis, written by Moses a long, long time ago, but is the Word of God. Genesis chapter 22, a chapter containing one of the most momentous events in human history. And yet few people knew about it until it was ultimately written by Moses. Genesis chapter 22, beginning with the sixth verse. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and a knife. They went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And I want to stop right there and use for a subject, Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? Would you bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, as we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, I would ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us, that we might give to these people that which you have given unto us. I would ask that you would anoint us to preach as you anoint the people to hear. And Lord, we have nothing to offer you except a willing mind and an obedient heart. And you have everything to offer us. Touch this people as you touch your word, and I'll ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. I think one could say without fear of exaggeration or contradiction that God has never asked anything of anyone as he asked that particular day some 4,000 years ago of Abraham. Now you have to understand at that time, as far as we know, Abraham and those with him were the only ones on the face of this earth who were living for God. We would have to include Melchizedek in this assortment, so to speak, of which we know very little about, but who was a type of Christ. But in the whole of the planet, the hundreds of millions who lived at that time, Abraham alone knew God and his loved ones also. Now, Abraham is, is a mystery. He's a mystique. We, we, we are hard put to explain him as we should. For instance, although the Lord gave detail as it regards the Apostle Paul's conversion, then called Saul, on the road to Damascus, Maybe the greatest conversion the world has ever known. But he failed to give us any information at all as it regards Abraham and how that he came out of idolatry. Joshua wrote, a Syrian ready to perish. His family idol makers quite wealthy, but idol makers of the little moon god Ur. But somehow God spoke to this man, how he did it. Some say that Shem witnessed to him, Noah's son, but there's no proof of that. But whatever and however the word came to the great patriarch, it was so powerful 
that he would uproot his family from one of the most advanced cities in the world of that day and take them to a land called Canaan and live in a tent the rest of his life. Now let me say that again. Coming from the lap of luxury, coming from every labor-saving device that was known at that time, coming from a beautiful home to live in a tent the rest of his life, seeking a city whose builder and maker is God. The struggle had been intense and in this struggle, Abraham failed at times. The struggle was this. It was the most important thing on the face of the earth, that, that for man to be redeemed, for man to be saved, for man to be brought out of this morass of, of sin and shame, for the fallen sons of Adam's lost race to be saved, God would have to become man. the incarnation. And for that to happen, he would have to have a people through whom this Redeemer could come. And he would have to raise up this people because none existed on the earth. And so, from the loins of Abraham and the womb of Sarah, this miracle child, Isaac, would be born. And Isaac shall your seed be called. I'm sorry, Muslims, but he did not say in Ishmael. He said in Isaac. The scripture says, Abraham as good as dead. How could Sarah conceive a child at 90 years of age? How could Abraham father a child at 100 years of age? But God planned it this way because all hope of the flesh had to die. Let me say that again. All hope of the flesh had to die before God could bring forth the promise. You say, well, what, what do you mean the hope of the flesh? I meant what man can do. They did everything they could do. Even to the point of Sarah calling in Abraham and saying, go into the Egyptian girl Hagar. And in those days, that was common. If the wife couldn't have a child, a surrogate would, would, would function in the place thereof. And the child would be looked at as the wife of the husband, the true wife of the husband. And Ishmael was the result. And it brought sorrow and heartache. And God paid a visit with two angels to Abraham's tent. And said, I'm coming down to look things over. <laughs> and said, tell your wife she's going to have a baby about this time next year. And Sarah laughed. It wasn't a laugh of faith. It was a laugh of skepticism. I'm 90 years old. No, I won't say that, what I was about to say. <laughs> and the Lord called her out. He said to her, you laughed. She said, no, I didn't. He said, yes, you did. But this time next year, you're going to have a baby. 
a little boy. And you're going to name him Laughter. That's what the name Isaac means, Laughter. Hallelujah. Be careful what you say. <laughs> and Isaac was born. Isaac is now, the Hebrew word, it, it, it could mean anywhere from 15 to 30 years old. He was probably about 15 or 16, to be frank with you, at this time. And God speaks to Abraham a word that is so shattering and so absolutely horrifying. And it doesn't tell us exactly how except to say that he spoke to him from heaven. It doesn't say it in the first verse. It, it says that God would tempt Abraham, and the translator should have translated it, and God did test Abraham or did prove Abraham because that's what the Hebrew word means in that first verse. God would prove Abraham. And he would tell him, take your only son, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, which was about 50 miles distant, and offer him up as a burnt offering. Now you think of that. And Abraham knew that God abhorred human sacrifices. And yet God is here telling Abraham, take your son, your son whom you love, and go and offer him up as a burnt offering. I can't imagine something like that. The manner in which God spoke to Abraham had to be extremely convincing, leaving no room for doubt for the great patriarch to obey God. Let me, let me say this, please. God... I think I can say without fear of any contradiction, has spoken at one time or the other, never to the degree he did that day to Abraham, but he's spoken to everyone in this building, everyone by radio, by television, by the internet. He's spoken to your heart. That's a heady thing. That term, God spoke to me, has been abused. Time and time again, it's been abused by preachers saying, God told me. Some few he did, most he didn't. I stood before you a year and a half ago, and I told you that God has spoken to me and told me to begin a network, a television network to cover this globe. And when we called in the people who, who are able to secure channels, you see, it's altogether different than buying time for the program we used to have one hour a week or 30 minutes a day. You go to stations and you purchase the time from them. But a, a channel for programming 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it has to go before the FCC in Washington. It's looked at as the same as you buying a station. And they said to me, there aren't any channels left to speak of. But if God says something, <laughs> hallelujah. I said, if God says something, I said, if God says something, <clears throat> And I said, well, do the best that you can. And 
Amazingly enough, about 30 days after we told them to do that, one of the major television marketers went bankrupt and left channels all over the nation available. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, now, are you saying that, that God made them go bankrupt? No, I'm not saying that. They just went bankrupt. The Lord wasn't with them because whatever the Lord does doesn't go bankrupt. Are you listening to me? Are you hearing me, saints of God? I know, oh yes, I know. I know how the devil can talk to you and tell you all kind of things. He'll tell you that you're not going to make it. He'll tell you that you, that pain in your side, it's cancer sure as world. He'll tell you that this time next year you'll be on a bread line. He'll tell you you're going to lose your job. He'll tell you that everybody hates you. He'll tell you he's going to do you in and he's going to bury you. But have you noticed? You're still here. Glory to God. He, he hasn't done it because he can't do it. Because he that's within me is greater woo, than he that's in this world. Satan has preached the funeral of untold multiplied millions of saints and they just kept living. Amen. Glory to God. Today, we're on 62 million households in the U.S., 14 million in the United Kingdom, nearly 4 million in Germany, and 17 million is about to added, be added to that shortly. I don't know how many millions in Africa. We're getting letters from Muslim countries. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Central America, South America, Mexico, the islands of the sea, this message has got to go to the entirety of the earth. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, they say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Ladies, don't they say that? I'm telling you the truth. You girls don't even know how to cook. <laughs> it means if you eat the pudding and it's good, well, that's the proof. It's good. <laughs> oh, that's what that means? Yeah. Hmm. A year and a half later, we're on nearly 100, in, in nearly 100 million homes. That says God spoke to us. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And what God told Abraham to do was so staggering. Take your son your only son, the one they had struggled and had fought every demon in hell, had cried to God. And Abraham at once said, I, I don't know what to do. And Ab the Lord told Abraham, come outside of the tent. Look up at the stars. Can you count them? Well, of course he couldn't. He said, your progenitory, your seed will be as the stars of the heavens. And he didn't have any children, none. All of this had to do with the coming of the Messiah. And God tells him to offer up his only son. There's no record that he told Sarah. I've wondered about that because the Lord had told Abraham that Sarah played just as well, of course she did, just as much a part in this as did Abraham. 
He didn't tell Abraham for quite some time that this child would come through Sarah. But then there came the day he did. Sarah will bring forth this child. All hope of the flesh had to die. All of man's efforts had to die. And then God could step in and do it. And uh, Sarah was an integral part of Abraham. I thank God that the Lord has given me a wife who, I'll be honest with you, I wish I had her faith. I wish I did. And uh, I've never seen her um, faithless, not one time. Now, she does do one thing that bothers me. <laughs> she says every time, are you sure we can afford that satellite? <laughs> and, and uh, of course, my answer is God told me. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. That kind of leaves her defenseless. And, uh, but to leave the humor aside, the, the part that she plays in this work, in this ministry, is incalculable. Amen. A woman has a greater intuition than a man does. A woman can read people more than a man can. I mean, somebody tells me, yeah, I say, oh, that's wonderful. Francis said he's lying. And about 99 and 99, 100% of the time, she's right. But Sarah played an integral part. But yet there is no word in the word that Abraham, when he was preparing the couple of donkeys that they took with him, and he had two young men that were with him, of course, with Isaac. I don't know what she asked, if she asked anything. The scripture's just a wall of silence. And he journeys for three days and nights with that load on his shoulders. You say, well, did he understand? No, he didn't understand. Would you have understood? This is the key. We are to obey even when we don't understand. There's no human being on the face of the earth unless God would have spelled it out. He understood it later, but then he didn't understand anything. Just take the boy to Moriah and kill him and burn his body on the altar as a whole burnt offering. I'll be frank with you. I don't know how that Abraham stood it. I don't know how that he was able to walk that 50 miles with that load on him. And he looks up and sees a mountain in the distance, and God said, that's the one. Now, here's the striking picture about this. Abraham didn't know it then and never did know it. But the exact spot where he was to build an altar and did and offer up Isaac. 
is where over a thousand years later the temple would be built. And the Holy of Holies in the temple, there was the holy place and the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant sat, was right over that stone, they say, on which Abraham built the altar. Now, they stop. He gives the wood that he's brought with him to Isaac. He takes the fire that they had it already smoldering in a receptacle in his hands and tells the servants that are remaining, stay here. I and the lad are going up to worship and we will be back. You get the terminology. You're hearing it. Two things said here. Number one, wor worship going to kill his son? Worship? Going to plunge a knife into his breast? Worship? Going to burn his body to ashes on an altar and worship? Listen to me. Why did he say, I and the lad are going up to worship? Because everything the child of God does, I mean everything, should be worship. Worship is what we are. Praise is what we do. All worship isn't, some of it isn't praise. I don't care if it's more in the yard. It should be to a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if you're working at McDonald's and that's the best you can do, be the best hamburger flipper that McDonald's has ever seen and do it all as unto the Lord. Is anybody understanding me? Every part of you, everything you do, what you are, is to be worship. Wor worship is what we are. Praise is what we do. Had a, back when our office was across town, hired a young man. I forget what we had him doing, but uh, every time I would go by, he would be praising the Lord. And, uh, he wasn't really tending to his work like he ought to. Because every time a package would be there, he'd pray over it. <laughs> that can make that package pretty expensive after a while. And uh, I mean, every time I'd walk by, he'd be, oh, Jesus, bless this record. Of blood. Yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. You say, well, that's wonderful unless you're paying the salary. <laughs> One day I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm gonna have to reprimand him. I said, uh, he can't do that. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you let him alone. The church he came out of, nobody could say anything and said, he's kind of trying to catch up on praising me. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God and the Lamb forever. And we will come back to you. Abraham believed that God would raise those ashes from the dead. He said, we're going to offer a burnt offering. Now, under the Levitical law, which was 500 years down the road, there were five great sacrifices. But the two most important among them were the whole burnt offering and the sin offering. 
the whole burnt offering, the sin offering. And they were, all of them were vastly important, but these two were the most important because the whole burnt offering, that's the only offering that they offered up until the law was given. Don't worry about him, he'll be an evangelist. <laughs> he heard me. <laughs> and... Uh, The whole burnt offering is the Lord giving his perfection to you. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. The sin offering is you giving all your sin to him. Amen. My Lord, you ought to shout. Amen. The sin offering is, is us giving all of our sins to him. The whole burnt offering, he in turn gives all of his perfection to me. My, 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 praise God. And the Bible said that Abraham built the altar. And he laid the wood on the altar, a type of the cross. And he tied Isaac's hands and his feet. And laid him on the altar. And at this stage of the game, Isaac knew what was about to happen. And Isaac said, Sir, this is the altar and this is the wood. But where is the lamb. Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? I want to ask a question. Assemblies of God, where is the lamb? Baptist, where is the lamb? Catholics, where is the lamb? Church of God, where is the Lamb? Foursquare, where is the Lamb? Methodist, where is the Lamb? Listen to me carefully. Without the cross, Christianity is no more than a vapid philosophy. Amen. Where is the Lamb? The church has embraced humanistic psychology, but my question is, where is the lamb? Only by the lamb, John the Baptist cried, behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Only by the cross can the drunkard be made free. Where is the lamb? Only by the cross can the drug addict lay down his heroin and his cocaine. Where is the lamb? Only by the cross can the person lay down their cigarettes. Where is the lamb? Only by the cross can what we sang about your life be changed. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? That's the question for the modern church. Some of you have worn out rehab centers. You've worn them out. They haven't done you any good and they won't but I present to you one who can change your life. Yes. Yes. Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. Where is the lamb? In our theology, where is the lamb? In the hermeneutics, where is the lamb? In the homiletics, where is the lamb? 
In our testimony, where is the lamb? In our preaching, where is the lamb? In our singing, where is the lamb? And Abraham said, son, and I love this, God will provide. Hallelujah. God will provide. He'll provide the Redeemer that'll change this world. He'll provide the Savior that will lift men out of the bondages of sin and darkness. He will provide the answer that we need. He'll provide the solution, and that solution is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And the Scripture says that he stretched forth his hand, Abraham did. Has anybody got a knife in your pocket? Any man got a knife in your pocket? If you girls have got one in yours, God help the husband you marry. <laughs> well, when you got saved, you threw away the knife. He stretched forth his hand. That's how close it was. It's the last moment. Stretched forth his hand. The muscles tightened. We, we, we talk about this, but what must have been going on in Abraham's mind? Oh, well, God... After the fact, it's easy to say a lot of things. But he bunches his shoulder and about to plunge that knife whenever God said, Abraham, Abraham. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Abraham, Abraham. That's the same one who said, Saul, Saul, Mary, Mary. You have gone far enough. And look over there. There's a ram caught in the bush. Go get that ram and offer him. Now, you, you can say anything you want to say. I'll imagine we've got some folk in this place. You're, you're just a proverbial deadhead. If you watch the Red Sea open, you'd say, Nice. But I'll guarantee you that Abraham and Isaac had a Pentecostal Holy Ghost, hallelujah, shouting good time. Glory to God and the Lamb forever. Hallelujah. I believe Abraham walked across the top of that hill, said, glory to God, glory to God. He said, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh. Woo! Kumbasa kelahi talabusheh. Papa, untie me. I can't shout like this. Well, how do you know they did all of that? What would you have done? What would you have done? And the Lord spoke again to Abraham. And said, because you've done what I told you to do. This was a, he was showing Abraham. Oh, I'd. This needs 10 sermons to preach it, but he was showing Abraham how that man would be redeemed. It would be by death, the death of God's only son. But he didn't tell Abraham the manner of that death. That would come to Moses. I think it's the 15th of the 21st, I forget which chapter of of uh, numbers, how that that death would come. But he told Abraham that it must be by death, but the death of a perfect sacrifice who would be his only son. Then he spoke again and said, Abraham, because you've done what I told you to do, told him three things. Number one, I'm going to bless you. And everything that's attached to you, I'm going to bless you. 
Now, I want you to know this. I'm taking that blessing for myself. You say, well, what about us? You too. Because Paul said we are Abraham's children. Glory to God. I'm in the family. I'm in the family. I want the blessing. I have the blessing. I'm getting the blessing. He has given me the blessing, the blessing, the blessing, the blessing. Last, no, Sunday night a week ago, I think it was, the Lord told me to pray, and you, you remember, that the people would have a spirit of giving. And then that the people would have a spirit of receiving. Praise God. When you ask God, for a blessing, you're not asking someone that's on food stamps. You're asking someone that owns all the hills and all the cattle on the hills and all the potatoes under the hills. You're asking God who can do anything. He said, I'll bless you. Glory to God, I'll bless you. And then number two, he said, your seed. Now that seed was Jesus Christ. But we are components of that seed. Your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. Uh, you say, well, I don't know what that means. That's Old Testament terminology that said your enemy will build walls and say strongholds and say you can't come in here. We control this. But Jesus Christ kicked that door down. Glory to God. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Glory to God, your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Glory to God. That means victory. That doesn't mean defeat. That means victory. Let's see how to say this. We've got too many Christians that's barely getting along. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can tell you what to do. Get in these altars or stay home. Don't mess up this place with that doubt and unbelief. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 You, you ought to believe in God who's going to give you the victory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, this, 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 this is the last one i got to close. In you. And your seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. Now, remember, he started out with Abraham telling him families will be blessed. Now, he says nations will be blessed. Let me tell you, hold on. A blessing is coming to your country. <laughs> Glory to God. I said a blessing is coming, a blessing is coming, a blessing is coming. Your seed will bless the nations, and I'm taking that to mean every nation on the face of this earth. Glory to God. I'll bless you. Your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. And number three, all the, your seed shall bless all the nations. Praise God. Praise God. I got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. Well, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Well, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. I've got a feeling. That's what Abraham was singing when he came down from that mountain. Everything's going to be all right. 
be all right, be all right, be all right. You got in the eights on that thing. shepherd boy armed only with a sling beside mighty Goliath he seemed to be such a puny little thing but David said you come to me with a spear and a sword
Give me some fast forwards.